I'm going to be talking about interspecific competition. Uh, my name's Sue Glenn. Uh, the slides are based on the textbook by Moles and Shear, uh, Ecology Concepts and Applications, which was published in 2019 by McGraw-Hill. It's the eighth edition. And uh, obviously, this is some of the cool stuff that uh, e ecology-based nature shows on TV. Uh, can be seen some exciting interactions between different species. Now, before I uh, get too deep into talking about interspecific competition, we already talked about competition within a species between um, individuals of your own species. Now we're going to be talking about competition between different species. And uh, this is uh, one of several ways that, that different species will interact with each other. And this nice little table is at the beginning of this chapter uh, where they're looking at uh, what we call these different types of interactions. So competition is where one species um, is or two species are interacting with each other and they are both harming each other in some way. So you could be looking at a hyena and a lion that are fighting over a carcass and no matter who wins they've both expended energy in fighting over that carcass. But when we look at um, mutualism both species will be benefiting from what's going on. So it could be we're looking at a sunflower that is being pollinated by a bee and the sunflower is spreading its genes and the bee is getting some food so they're both benefiting. Um, after we've, we're done with this chapter on competition we'll be talking about predation and a predation obviously one is benefiting and the other is getting eaten. Um, commensalism is where you can have uh, one benefiting and it's not really hurting the other one at all. So it could be uh, something like a, a epiphyte, an air plant growing on the trunk of a, a tree in the tropical rainforest and he's just getting rainwater, it's trickling down with nutrients in it. He's not actually a parasite, he's not hurting the, the um, a tree and uh, he's just benefiting from it. Or it could be um, a, an ant at your picnic where it's eating the crumbs that you're dropping. It's not hurting you, but it's benefiting the, the ant. Um, a mentalism is where one species uh, is being hurt and the other species is not being affected by it in any way. So it might be I have a, a garden that's under um, a hickory tree and it's fairly heavily shaded by that hickory tree and I'm trying to grow uh, potato plants in there and they're just getting so much shade from the hickory tree that they're being hurt but the potatoes aren't having any impact on that hickory tree whatever it's doing it does, it's unaware of those potatoes down there. And then uh, neutralism is two species that uh, are living um, close to each other but they might not be interacting in any way uh, or hurting each other in any way because they're using different parts of the plant or it could be birds in a spruce tree that are eating different things from the spruce tree so they are not actually uh, impacting each other in a negative or positive way they're just in the same area in the same habitat doing their own thing. We've talked about the concept of a niche before in uh, earlier chapters uh, and it's, it, we're going to be talking about it again because it's a very important concept when we're talking about competitive exclusion. So a niche is the all the environmental factors that influence the growth, survival, and reproduction of a species. So it's all the, the uh, conditions that it needs to live that it can live in. And uh, Gauze uh, proposed the principle of competitive exclusion that if two species have identical niches, they have an identical set of factors, they can't live in the same place indefinitely. They can't coexist indefinitely. One will be a better competitor and that has a higher fitness level and it'll eventually exclude the fit of the other. So what is fitness here? We're talking about fitness uh, in the way you would in an evolutionary sense. Fitness is your ability to reproduce and, and produce viable offspring. So one's going to be um, more successful of that than that at the other and eventually it would exclude the other. So this principle of competitive exclusion comes into play when we're dealing with interspecific competition between different species. 
So just a reminder of what a niche is. Hutchinson defined this niche as an n-dimensional hypervolume, where n is the number of environmental factors that are important to the survival and the reproduction of a species, of a particular species. So if we're looking at, you know, one might be the amount of one one factor might be the amount of food. One factor might be the amount of uh, space that you have. Another factor might have to do with uh, temperatures. And you just keep adding factors and factors and factors. It's an n-dimensional hypervolume. Now, we talk about something called a fundamental niche and a realized niche. So your fundamental niche is the hypervolume of all the possible conditions that you could survive in. And the realized niche um, is actually where you're found. And uh, because of competition or predation or your interactions with other species, you might not be able to live all the places within your um, hypervolume. So I might be able you know, within my fundamental niche, you know, one of the places I could live is a, a beautiful penthouse apartment in New York City, like shown in the top picture uh, from the show Succession. Um, my realized niche, because of competition, has restricted my environments, and I'm stuck in a crappy motel room like in the bottom picture from Schitt's Creek. Uh, so, uh, you know, you don't get to actually live in all the possible places. And it's really hard to measure all of these uh, factors factors that um, are part of the niche. It's a very difficult concept to actually get your head around is how do we measure all of the pieces of your, your environment. We keep coming back to Darwin's finches. We talked about it in chapter 10. We talked about it in chapter 11. Um, and uh, we do now know quite a bit of information about them. And so here we're, we're uh, narrowing down how we're talking about the niche in terms of what kinds of foods are used by the birds. And we know that these were uh, reflected by the formation of different beak sizes. Um, and so uh, there was work by Lack, who was actually looking at the differences in beak size and form. And then Peter Grant, remember we talked about the grants, um, uh, looked at um, the feeding niches of the, the finches based on their beak size. Because of selected pressure from competition for food, uh, they evolved to have different feeding niches. And so the large ground finch, uh, Geospiza um, magna, Rostrus eats the big seeds, the medium ground finch, the fortis eats the medium sized seeds, and the small ground finch uh, eats the small seeds. So the size of the seeds that can be eaten by the finches is estimated by looking at the depth of their beaks. And so um, when we look at seed use by the difference by the fortis one, um, it showed that even within a species, it's beak size was uh, affected by the composition of its diet. So we can see on the graph on the right that the uh, ones that were eating the soft seeds um, had the smaller beaks and the ones that were eating the hard seeds um, had the uh, largest, deepest beaks. Um, and we said that was really important. Uh, the beak size was important for the seed use when we were looking. Remember when we were looking at the, the droughts before with this particular species, um, the medium ground finch. And remember, we had found that the droughts had uh, reduced the vegetation and the food. We looked at these pictures in, uh, I think this was in chapter 11, uh, where the, the drought had decimated the food source. And that we found that uh, that led to mortality of the finches uh, with those drought years. Um, so that was back in, in chapter 11. But um, this mortality didn't actually, um, wasn't uh, playing out equally on all segments of the population. So as the seeds were depleted, the birds ate the smallest and the softest seeds first, and that just left the largest and tougher seeds behind. And because the um, uh, tougher seeds were were being left behind that only the uh, individuals that were uh, had the deeper beaks that were able to crack them were the ones that going to survive. And at the end of the drought, then the uh, population was do dominated by the ones with the 
the bigger beaks, the larger, stronger beaks that could survive by eating uh, the hard seeds. So we can see here, um, following those droughts, that the relative uh, size uh, was going to be uh, just the, the bigger birds were dominating the population then. So competition between species can actually lead to partitioning the resource between species over time or even in uh, eating different things in different places. Um, and uh, here's an example of this using these uh, slug caterpillars. And slug caterpillars, you know, caterpillars uh, grow quite rapidly. They get, get through uh, trying to avoid being little caterpillars because it's easy to eat a little caterpillar. Um, and uh, these guys have all these cool little uh, defenses uh, against being eaten. Um, and uh, what they found, they had they had mourning colors, they had stinging spines to defend themselves, but uh, they could still get eaten by uh, flies and wasps that would parasitize these guys. And uh, so that they found that it was easier to obviously eat little ones uh, than big ones. If you're a little fly, you're gonna eat the little ones. Um, and so uh, they found that the the caterpillars are tiny when they hatch and, and they grow bigger and things as they grow, <clears throat> different things will eat them at the different stages. So all these flies and moths are competing to eat these caterpillars and they're all uh, sort of focusing in on a different size uh, for their feeding behavior. Um, yeah, so we know that they, they go from little guys to big guys getting to be big fat caterpillars in the hopes that nobody can, can eat them. But here we have the flies and wasps, and we're looking on the x-axis at the caterpillar size and these different stages. And so we can see the feeding uh, of the, the feeding amounts of the different uh, species of wasps and flies are going to focus on different sizes of the caterpillars. So they're basically uh, dividing this caterpillar resource, and different ones are eating them at different sizes. Uh, the researcher. Um, uh, uh, Shannon Murphy uh, was interested in seeing whether that was uh, really that they were partitioning out the different sizes or were they just uh, what was available at the time that they were looking for food. And so she took a whole bunch of little ones, little caterpillars, and put them out at the same time as the big ones were out there and found that, no one, that still the wasps were eating the little ones and the flies were eating the big ones. And uh, so that was really based on the the size of the caterpillars. So it's a really, uh, competition is a really strong selective force in uh, dividing out resources. This is a bonus example I, I'm pulling in to talk about tall grass prairie competition, uh, interspecific inter competition between the plants growing in this biome. This is a picture taken in Conza Prairie which is part of the Flint Hills in northeastern Kansas. It's a research natural area that's run by Kansas State University. And, and in this uh, uh, location, they have this really cool experiment going on. They're looking at uh, the effect of fire. So they have different parts of the different watersheds in this landscape that they have on different burning cycles. And then they have a third of the area is ungrazed. A third of the area is grazed by bison, which is the natural uh, original uh, ungulate that was grazing this habitat. And then a third of the area is grazed by cattle so they can look at the impacts and differences. But I found this really cool uh, site that was looking at a root competition in these plants. We know there's six, significant competition going on um, above ground uh, for light for these plants. Uh, some of the, the short grasses uh, obviously cannot compete against some of these tall grasses. This uh, Indian grass is the fourth one in this uh, lineup. But uh, we can also see that the roots, some of them are going very deep, tapping into deep groundwater. Some are relatively shallow. Uh, some are spreading out. So there's quite a bit of competition going on there. And I want to show you this National Geographic article uh, that they were looking at this uh, root competition. This is an article on the nationalgeographic.com website. Uh, looking at uh, photography by a photographer named Jim Richardson. 
And uh, here we see some Indian grass where we can see the uh, a photograph of the, the plant with the, the huge intricate root system. And uh, this was done in uh, Kansas in the, the Flint Hills. And uh, you can see uh, one of the researchers working on this area where they are studying root competition. Uh, this is Jerry Glover's work in a soil pit in um, Salina, Kansas. And uh, he's looking at the wheatgrass roots and the shallow roots of uh, uh, wheat. Uh, in this particular example. And most of the plants are found underground. So we, we can look at these above ground portions, but then to see these extracted root systems, like these are amazing. This is a, a compass plant. So the compass plant has this extensive root system. We just see this little plant up top and it's got this nice little yellow flower that follows the sun like a, a compass. You can scroll down here. You can look through these uh, websites and, and see the um, amazing deep root systems. That's a Missouri goldenrod. And here we have put in a person for scale. So you can see these plants are much bigger um, that they would maybe be coming up to their waist uh, with those flower stalks above ground. But when you get below ground, we're rather dwarfed by them. And that is the, uh, that's a, a whole mess of uh, three plants put together. So it's an Indian grass compass plant and big blue stem grass, which you just cannot uh, separate out all of those roots without breaking them. And to do this, he grew them in a great big drum and then he could uh, uh, open it up and uh, wash away the soil. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the intricate roots up close here. This is an Indian grass root that uh, goes deep into the soil. Look at that mass of roots. So obviously competition for water and nutrients is really important. The other website, when I found this, uh, led me to, I was interested in this uh, photographer, Jim Richardson, and he has uh, his own website, jimrichardsonphotography.com, uh, which shows some, some amazing landscapes and people um, around the world, but this is his one with all these uh, prairie root pictures for the different species, which is kind of um, interesting to take a look at. What what he talked about was uh, the difficulty he had getting these pictures, and they had to basically scan in pieces of, of uh, the plants. So you can see the how many scans he had to do in his studio to get these awesome pictures of these uh, plant roots. So I encourage you to look up Jim Richardson photography.com. Also search on National Geographic and Jim Richardson and you can find these uh, sites very easily. So we've got the end of the section 13.2. There's a couple of concept review questions for you to pay attention to. One is um, the competitive exclusion principle states that two species cannot occupy the same niche indefinitely. What's the fundamental assumption of this principle? And the second one, do resources have to be present in limited supplies for comp competition to shape a species niche or species niches? Um, we're next going to move into looking at mathematical uh, models. So we'll be looking at the Lutka Volterra uh, models of uh, species competition. I highly recommend uh, the next video for understanding how those models work. And then we're also going to talk about some uh, laboratory models uh, testing some of the assumptions of Lutka Volterra models. So we will see you in the uh, next episode of uh, the species interactions and competition chapter.